Stockholm Syndrome is a contested psychological phenomenon theorized to explain the bonding of hostages to their captors. The concept originates from specific circumstances, including power imbalances in situations such as kidnapping and abusive relationships. However, due to its infrequent occurrence, it is challenging to draft valid studies with sufficient sample size, resulting in a contested illness. Due to doubts over its legitimacy, while emotional connections between captive and captor may surface, some view them as irrational due to the danger the victims are facing. Despite its rare occurrence, the paradox of Stockholm Syndrome lies in the sympathetic sentiments captives feel towards captors, contrary to the expected fear and disdain. The condition has not been recognized within the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DM due to a lack of consistent academic research. Data from the FBI indicates that approximately 8E of hostages demonstrate signs of Stockholm Syndrome. The term Stockholm Syndrome originated from an event in 1973 when Jan Eric Olson, a paroled convict, took four employees of a major bank in Stockholm, Sweden, hostage. None of the hostages would testify against the captors, even raising money for their defense after their release Swedish criminologist and psychiatrist Nils Bejerat coined the term following the incident. An account from one of the hostages, Christine Enmark, suggested the police acted incompetently, forcing the hostages to negotiate their own release. This resulted in a deep-rooted distrust towards the police, as the captors were viewed as acting more rationally than the negotiator. The name Stockholm Syndrome was popularized after this incident, signifying the psychological bonding of hostages with their captors under stress. Filled Circumstances The rapport between hostages and their captors is a striking theme in this narrative. Conversely, the captives' cooperation with their captors led to a most unsettling outcome, their survival, forcing an unusual intimacy that culminated in frightful living conditions likened to goats living in indescribable filth. Take, for instance, the gripping tale of Patty Hearst, heiress of publishing tycoon William Randolph Hearst. In 1974, she was abducted by a city-staged guerrilla group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, Mythens. Hearst, now known as Tanya, was soon seen on public record denouncing her lineage and even assisting the group in bank heists. The turning point was her apparent affinity for the guerrilla band. However, her defense of Stockholm Syndrome, although not explicitly cited due to its recent coinage, fell on deaf ears during her court trial, her defense attorney. F. Lee Bailey could only helplessly watch as Hearst was sentenced to seven years in prison eventually. The sentence was lightened and in a surprising twist firmly endorsed by President Bill Clinton who acknowledged her actions as non-volitional. Interestingly, there's also a reverse scenario known as Lima Syndrome, a term coined after an incident at the Japanese embassy in Peru, where the hostage takers seemingly developed a sentimental attachment to their victims. It's a theory largely based on the unusual events of the 1996 Lima hostage crisis, but it remains elusive due to scant evidence and intriguing point to note was the lot of the hostages were articulate diplomats, which could have facilitated a bond via articulate conversation. Hostages with Stockholm Syndrome tend to develop an empathetic bond with their captors, identifying with their causes, even perceiving the authorities as adversaries. The syndrome's aftermath often leaves the escaped victims grappling with a slew of emotional and physical fallout, ranging from depression, aggression, pets D, intensifying health conditions, and a bizarre dependence on their captors. The 1970s was a time fraught with unease over the lurking threat of brainwashing documented meticulously by Robbins and Anthony, who paralleled Stockholm Syndrome to a similar affliction they studied, the destructive cult disorder. They concluded that the extensive media coverage focused on brainwashing played a significant role in Stockholm Syndrome's recognition as a legitimate psychological condition. Leading a research group, Namiak has unearthed the surprising fact that, despite widespread media attention, Stockholm Syndrome is actually under-researched, and the findings that have emerged are contradictory and inconsistent. There is no concrete definition or diagnostic criteria, which has resulted in the stretching of the term to include any kind of abuse. The DMCI-5, recognized by the American Psychiatric Association as a leading classification system for psychological disorders, has historically not included Stockholm Syndrome, as many psychologists believe it is a part of either trauma bonding or post-traumatic stress disorder, pre the lack of. 
Substantial research and a general consensus has further complicated attempts to establish its classification before the release of the fifth edition of the DSM. Stockholm Syndrome was even considered under disorders of extreme stress, not otherwise specified. At the 2015 Dignity Conference, Dr. Alan Wade challenged the idea of Stockholm Syndrome in his presentation, suggesting that concepts such as this, traumatic bonding, learned helplessness, battered women syndrome, internalized oppression, and identification with the aggressor prapsers, veer away from factual events and contexts, and instead create fictitious pathologies within victims' minds, particularly women's minds. Stockholm Syndrome is but one of many constructs used to muzzle those victims who dare to voice their experiences about the negative societal and institutional reactions they have faced. In her critically acclaimed 2019 examination of domestic abuse, See What You Made Me Do, Australian journalist Jess Hill frames Stockholm Syndrome as a questionable, misogynistic pathology that lacks established diagnostic criteria and asserts that most diagnoses are media, made rather than originating from psychologists or psychiatrists. Her analysis of the handling of the original Stockholm robbery, the event that birthed the syndrome's name, highlights the misguided actions of the Stockholm authorities, inspired by Bajorup, which put the hostages in more danger from police actions than their captors. She criticizes Bajorot's diagnosis of hostage Christine Enmark, which was made without having interviewed her and was directly linked to her public criticism of his actions during the robbery incident. 